All right, I'm back, and hopefully it's to stay this time. So, NASCAR Thunder 2004 is a game that needs no introduction. It's one of the greatest NASCAR games of all time, and it's easily one of the best racing games of all time, if I'm being entirely honest. Now, I'm not saying it's perfect by any stretch of the imagination, but among its competition, and especially recent NASCAR games, it's quite amazing. But, you know, I personally did not grow up with NASCAR Thunder 2004, and that's because I own Nintendo GameCube. The first time I ever played this game was actually in 2017. And you know what? I have never experienced an entire career mode in NASCAR Thunder 2004. So a little while ago, I set out to change that fact. And you know what? Step one of any EA Sports career mode is creating a stupid player character. So allow me to introduce you to Flip Witham, born April 1st, of 1976 in Bean Goose, Ohio. Now the driver name, pretty sure you can tell, is inspired by what I spent most of the last video doing. But now the team is owned by Oil Tycoon and commercial opportunist H.J. Balls. We'll be contesting the 2003 NASCAR Winston Cup Series season in the number 121 Ford. That's because I could not think of any triple digit numbers that weren't Dan Gurney's. So we're basically bootleg Wood Brothers. And you know, because I'm such a caring car owner, I signed every single member of my team off of their stats alone, and I don't even know their names. Now this is going to be a 36 race season contested on Legend difficulty with 25% races. I got primary sponsorship from Nikon and Easy Care for the first few races of the 03 season, so we at least have a little bit of guaranteed income as long as I don't wreck. Speaking of which, I have only one goal for this entire season, and that's don't DNF. I literally do not have the money or the infrastructure to deal with any DNFs, at least to start this season. And if I can run a clean season, I should be pretty solidly up in the point standings. You're going to see me try a bit more of a Matt Kenseth approach to this season, unlike the Ross Chastain approach I took during the 31st Lightning Challenge video I did a little while back. And so we headed off to Daytona with a brand new team, not a lot of money, and very little idea of what we were doing. For added performance, I did run custom setups basically the whole season. With good gearing and high starting tire pressures, I did manage to qualify 17th for the Daytona 500, and I spent almost my entire 125 share drafting with Jeff Burton and blocking Tony Stewart. I ended up finishing in 8th position, moving up one row for the 500. I took advantage of a real good checkup at the start of the Daytona 500 to pick up another 4 spots, and settled into the first stint until I got just a little bit too high up the racetrack trying to let people buy and nearly caused a big one, but instead I ended up passing Joe Nemechek. On my first pit stop, my pit crew made me real proud by screwing up and giving me nearly a 20 second stop. I cycled out in 23rd position and I found really good drafting partners in both Hermie Sadler and Jack Sprague because, you see, they're too slow to escape my draft. I went in for right side tires on my final stop and my crew actually pitted the car correctly and I cycled out in 21st. I actually stayed there thanks to help from Mike Skinner and Elliot Sadler. Thinking about it from a money perspective, it's quite a bit of cash. And using said cash, I purchased a chassis shop at the end of the race and I basically continued putting every single dime that I made back into the equipment. Next up was Rockingham, where I rammed Joe Nemechek into turn one because he checked up. And beyond that, I was just slow. I held people up the whole race by running the bottom no matter what. If you wanted to pass me, you had to go to the outside. On lap 68, I learned that you could wall an AI car without even touching them. And so I had a little bit too much fun with that concept and my boredom running out and basically last. But fortunately, the caution got me pretty well into my pit window. I ended up finishing in 30th. Then it was on to Las Vegas, the first mile and a half race of the season. I was still really slow though, and basically nothing happened in the race except for a lot of riding around the back, but I at least got into an intense battle towards the end for 35th with Kevin LePage, edging him out barely for the spot. Then it was on to Atlanta. I ran pretty solid there thanks to the share draft, which allowed me to get into DRS trains and ride in positions way better than I should have been. I only fell from 22nd spot down to 28th place. Next up was Darlington, which is a track that I love to race, but I knew that my equipment was not up for the challenge. I actually qualified 15th for the race, but that was because I cut off about a quarter mile of the track during my run. I had a run in with Kevin Harvick during the race where I basically missed the corner, but he was too stupid to realize that I suck, and he got mad at me about it, with the exception 
of a dumb incident with Christian Fittipaldi on lap 28 because I didn't know he was pitting. Nothing happened in this race. Thanks to a slow pit crew and a bad car, we ended up fading back to 30th. Then it was on to Bristol, which was a race I had been dreading for quite a while up to that point. I somehow qualified in 25th position, but that was not at all an indication of what was to come. To keep with my whole don't DNF ideology, I've just rode around incredibly slow so I didn't risk either wrecking the car or getting ran over from behind. Races like this are exactly why I didn't do this in 30-some individual videos, because the best thing this race could have been was a relaxation tape. On lap 41, I attempted to come down pit road and ended up entering the wrong pit lane. I then tried staying out, hoping for a caution, and then I ran out of gas. But fittingly, we got a caution for absolutely nothing, but it was already after. I'd ran out of gas and had to come to pit road, so I was triple screwed. On the last stop, I took some wedge out of the car, just hoping I could maybe turn the rest of the race into a test session. But that adjustment didn't work, and I ended up no talenting around. So I had to then take that adjustment right out of the car, and rode around aimlessly until the race was over. I finished in 41st position, simply because Michael Waltrip and Joe Nemechek blew up. It was at this point that Dale Jr. became the championship favorite, by the way. In just six races, he has four wins. Next race was Texas. I actually qualified in 11th, and this was the first race of this whole career mode where I was genuinely fast, and I didn't have to rely on the DRS trains. I actually raced my way all the way up to fourth before the first cycle of pit stops, but my pit crew was required to screw it up because we were running well, and I ended up cycling out in eighth position, which is still really good. I did manage to hustle and race my way back up to 5th though, then on my second stop I cycled out in 6th, and that's just because Dale Jr. not only short pitted, but also had a 4 tire pit stop under 16 seconds. I did not have the pace to hold off Mark Martin, but funny enough, Dale Earnhardt Jr. blew up on the last lap, and I took 6th spot back for my first career top 10 finish. Next up was Talladega. I only qualified in 28th, but that was not much of a concern to me. It's Talladega, something stupid's gonna happen, and I need to make sure that I'm there to capitalize on it. Fun fact, I tried share drafting with Tony Stewart, but his equipment is so much better than mine that he just left me in the dust by himself. I had a really good draft going with Jamie McMurray until he brake check coming into turn three, avoiding cars coming back onto the racetrack, I then reinitiated the draft with McMurray until I ran out of gas at the perfect time to come down pit road, maximizing my fuel strategy. But the most impressive part of my first pit stop was the fact that my gas man completely missed his mark when he tried to start fueling the car. I took right side tires on my second stop, left side tires on my third stop just to save time since Talladega really doesn't wear tires. That combined with the fact that other drivers kept running out of gas on track for some reason allowed me to work my way up into the top 10. In the end, I held off Bobby Labonte to take home an eighth place finish. Next up was Martinsville, and that was even worse than Bristol. I was terrible in qualifying, but yet still somehow qualified in 25th, but that was the highlight of the weekend for me. It didn't take very long for someone to find the sand barrels, though. On lap 2, I put Kevin LePage into them. And just a little bit later, on lap 12, I managed to wreck myself. Not a major concern, though. In fact, it was expected. And then Kevin LePage passed me on the outside, only 20 laps after I put him into the sand barrels, and it was at that very moment that I realized I'm wasting my time even trying to race anybody. From that point forward, I actually stopped shifting out of fourth gear just to conserve fuel, and I ran the non-existent Martinsville High Line just to ride around and hope not to DNF from getting rammed from behind. Then Christian Fittipaldi managed to cause a caution by doing absolutely nothing, but unfortunately, it did not benefit my situation at all. On lap 52, I spun around, and then I later put Jack Sprague and Dale Jarrett into the sand barrels just for my own amusement. But then I noticed that Steve Park had managed to cheese himself into the lead thanks to the dumb cautions that I caused. Now, Bill Elliott caused a late race caution by doing absolutely nothing, and I knew that I had to save Steve Park from getting passed by this season's unstoppable Dale Earnhardt Jr. So I had a plan, cause a caution with just a few laps to go so that this race ends under yellow. I mean, it's not like I had anything better to do other than manipulate the outcome of the race while I'm running nine laps down in last, but the plan worked. Steve Park took the victory in the AOL Chevrolet for Richard Childress Racing with only three cars on the lead lap. 
I ended up finishing in 42nd, so at least I wasn't last. It was after that race that my sponsorship contracts ran out and I picked up a new primary sponsor from NASCAR.com. I also got Quality Plus Ford dealers on the car, so we look even more like bootleg Wood Brothers. Heading into Fontana, I added a little bit of trim to the paint scheme just to make it look a little more modern looking without overdoing it. I qualified in 38th. But I was able to run a lot better than that thanks to the DRS trains, and using the draft to my advantage, I ended up finishing in 26th position, right behind Ricky Craven. Next up was Richmond, which, sure it's a short track, but it's not as short as Bristol or Martinsville, so I wasn't quite as worried coming in. Somehow, I won my first career pole award, which means I'm locked into the Bud shootout. Just because I start on the pole, that doesn't mean I'm gonna do very well. I ran out of talent on exactly lap number 9, and made contact with both Dale Jr. and Joe Nemechek, and Joe was shockingly angry at me about the fact that he didn't have the foresight to know I was gonna wreck. Either way, I didn't DNF, I eventually fell back to 35th position before the first pit stop, but coming to pit road, Hermie Sadler desperately wanted to get down to the apron before me, and I wasn't letting that happen, so he aborted his attempt, and coming back onto the racetrack, he got himself right reared by Bobby Labonte bringing the caution flag out. And after a lot more riding around, I took home a 29th place finish. Next up was the Winston, which I obviously had to try to make by transferring through the Open. I qualified in seventh spot for the Open, and only the winner transfers to the Winston. So my goal was pretty simple, drive through the whole field and transfer. And I actually managed to pull it off, and I pocketed $52,000. But I knew I didn't have the pace to, you know, win the big money. But I at least wanted to have a chance. In the Winston, I managed to make my way from a 20-second starting spot up into the top 10 just by hooking the bottom line and getting in them DRS trains. My pit crew screwed up the mandatory pit stop during segment 1, but fortunately I finished the segment 17th, which was good enough to transfer into segment 2. During segment 2, I raced my way back up to 9th, and while that does sound good on paper, I was just one spot away from starting in first in the third segment because of the inversion. But you know, in the final segment, I had to fight my way back up from ninth, and uh, I was only able to make it up to seventh before I ran out of laps. Kevin Harvick took home the million dollars, but I'd like to think that I at least made a splash in my first career Winston. And then we moved on to the Coke 600, where I actually qualified in ninth. You know what, I was actually pretty fast in the Coke 600. I even raced my way all the way up to fourth position until the tire wear disparity kicked in in full force and I started to drop off very fast from my competition. During the second stint, I fell back to 11th before I nearly destroyed myself on the front stretch after making a little bit of contact with Ryan Newman. The only thing that saved me from DNFing was just how close I was to the start-finish line. Kyle Petty brought out the caution flag after dropping some debris, and I took advantage of a major checkup on the front stretch to get back up into the top 10. I then wrecked in basically the same exact way as I had earlier, this time after hitting Sterling Marlin, but this wasn't exactly a bad thing, as it got me into my fuel window. And then I nearly wrecked again, this time with Matt Kenseth, but I still managed to avoid disaster. I then spent the last 20 laps fighting my way back through the field and actually took home a 10th place finish, which I was quite proud of, all things considered. Dover didn't start off too well. Kevin Grubb checked up way more than I ever expected him to, and I plowed straight into him, but then I got myself into another rivalry because Rusty Wallace kept trying to go to my outside while my car was extremely tight. Then right as I was coming to pit road for my second pit stop of the race, Johnny Benson absolutely right-reared and destroyed Kurt Busch coming into turn three, bringing out the caution flag. Johnny went on to flip and collect Mark Martin, Ricky Rudd, and Jeremy Mayfield as well. Now this wreck not only trapped some drivers a lap behind me, but it also got me perfectly into my fuel window. Needless to say, JB's getting a Christmas card. Later on in the race, I drove like a madman through the field in an effort to finish in the top 30 and satisfy some of my sponsor contracts. And in the end, it turned to a last lap duel between me and Jeremy Mayfield for 30th. Now, I didn't care how much of a rival he'd be after this race. And that's because I needed that money. So I body slammed Mayfield out of the way in turn one and kept him to my outside so he couldn't try anything clever into turn three. He was very angry. But I'm $149,000 richer after this race, so his emotions don't really matter that much to me. Next up was Pocono, 
where I ran to the wall, but still somehow qualified in fourth. But I wasn't very fast in the race. I slowly lost spots until I was running all the way back in 34th. I also had a close call with Jeff Green when uh, Brett Bodine blew up in front of him and I nearly plowed right into the number one car. One lap later though, I spun out by myself in the tunnel turn and brought out the caution. I nearly destroyed my fuel cell in the process when I rejoined the track in front of Kyle Petty. Later on though, KP tried to pin me between the wall and his car and I was not having any of it. So I just finished him off and went agricultural racing. I was actually mad enough in this wreck to say screw it and come to Pit Road while Pit Road was closed simply because I just didn't care at that point. I made my way back up to 34th before Fittipaldi caught me by surprise coming into the tunnel turn. So I pulled off a full Tokyo drift and then used Jeff Green to straighten the car out and I didn't wreck but I did get a caution. I drove pretty hard in the final few laps and ended up finishing in 32nd spot. Not very good, but it also could have been way worse. Then we went to Michigan, which is the definition of a powerhouse track, so expectations were pretty low. However, I did manage to qualify in 14th position, and thanks to DRS, I actually ran pretty well during the race. I only made rivals with Michael Waltra. In the end, some drivers actually made it to the finish on one stop. Many others, including myself, had to go for two stops. So, because I was at a strategy disadvantage, I ended up finishing in 23rd, which is still really good for a powerhouse track such as this in first season equipment. Also, don't ask me how but there was a major wreck after the checkered flag with Elliot Sadler catching on fire. I imagine it involved someone running out of gas at a very wrong time. Then we were off to Sonoma, or Infineon Raceway as it was then, and I pulled off a fourth place qualifying time. Now, I don't know if this is just me, but I personally cannot get a good feel for the road courses in this game. Now, this is probably called a skill issue, but most of the time, the cars just feel like they're floating. Like, the rear end just constantly wants to pass the front, and I just can't get a good feel for really any flat track in this game. It's just one of those things I have to get used to. You know, I was decently quick in the race at Sonoma, but I was my own worst enemy. I spun out on four separate occasions. And eventually, the race ended under caution. Jerry Nadeau avenged his 2002 loss in this race, and I actually finished in 11th. Then we were back to Daytona. From the drop of the green flag, I immediately started the share drafting games, going from Schrader to Rudd to Nadeau to Labonte to Sadler, only to go back to Nadeau, and all the while, I'm just using them to help my car get above 177 miles an hour on the straightaway. Me and Kyle Petty, we became friends during this race, and we left Pocono in the distant past. I took right side tires on my final pit stop, and I closed out a 17th place finish. Another consistent and solid run. Then we were off to Chicagoland, where my expectations really weren't that high. I started in 24th and took advantage of the Robert Yates teammates of Sadler and Jared attempting to wreck each other on the front stretch, but it was pretty much all downhill from there. I had settled into a pretty good pace running back around 32nd spot. That is until I somehow hit Matt Kenseth while he was coming off pit road, flipping him onto his side and causing a caution. There was also an unrelated disaster on the front stretch involving Dale Jarrett, which I just have no clue how that one happened. Then on the restart, debris came off Elliot Sadler's car. Take a guess who ran it over. Yeah, I was just lucky it wasn't automatic DNF. So that incident brought me to pit road, and on the subsequent restart, debris came off Ricky Craven's car. And guess who ran it over? We ended it under caution, and I finished in 39th spot on three tires. Somehow, it was both a race to forget and also unforgettable. Also, I'd like to know how Matt Kenseth recovered from a flip to take a 12th place finish. Anyway, it was on to New Hampshire next, where I qualified in third position because I was downshifting in the center of the corners, which by the way is something I can't do in the race, at least not very much because I have terrible fuel efficiency. So I basically drifted back to 32nd once we got going in the race where I kind of plateaued around that spot. I also narrowly avoided destroying Hermie Sadler when I right-reared him coming into turn three because I didn't know he was on my inside. I just spent the rest of the race riding around trying to keep the thing clean, and I ended up in 39th again. Then it was back to Pocono, and I could already tell that my equipment was a lot better than it was the last time that we ran here. I mean, I pushed my car hard in qualifying because it was actually sticking in the corners, and I actually put my car on pole by more than half a second 
Now, I didn't have that kind of pace in the race, but I was still pretty decent. I actually settled in right around 18th position. And while not much actually happened in this race, I did learn something that was really important. I am really good in the tunnel turn. I mean, I suck quite badly in turns one and three, but in turn two, I've just found something there. And guess what? The next race is Indianapolis, which is four of those turns a lap. So at Pocono, I had a nice and calm final stint, and I actually ended up finishing in 15th. And next up was Indianapolis Motor Speedway for the Brickyard 400. Just a reminder, we're a brand new team with a car rating of 53 for this race, and we went and put it on the pole for the Brickyard 400 above Jeff Gordon. But you know, I didn't have that good of a start, but I was not going to let anyone stand in the way of me leading my first career laps. I got by Jeff Gordon in turn four on the first lap, and I was officially leading. I took everything that I learned from Pocono and applied it right here, paying extra attention, keeping my tires happy since I did not want to suffer that big time fall off at the end of the run like I've had at a lot of tracks. I was actually driving away from the field, which was something I didn't think I'd experience this season. Now, you know, my pit crew made a slight mistake on the first pit stop, that's kind of expected, but I got by Dale Jr. and Ryan Newman to take the lead back. And then I hit pit road for the final time on lap 27, and for some reason, my pit crew nailed it. It was up to me now to close the deal, which is exactly how I had wanted it. I cycled out as the leader on lap 38 with a three second advantage above Kevin Harvick. Utilizing lap traffic to my advantage, I headed off turn four with only a one second lead above Harvick, but that was all I needed. I took my first career victory in this NASCAR Thunder 2004 career mode in the 2003 Brickyard 400 in Indianapolis. You know, usually I protest the fact that we're not running at IRP, but I actually skipped that for this race. This here was something special. This race paid big money. Obviously that win gave me tremendous confidence and I kind of needed that coming into Watkins Glen since I spun out four times on the last road race. I won my third consecutive pole and I called off my second lap just so that I didn't wreck it. And you know, again, I had a bad start, I kind of always do, but I, you know, played a little fast and loose with the rule book through the bus stop and I got the lead back. I then proceeded to royally screw myself into turn one, bringing out the first caution. I restarted in 17th and drove with a death wish back through the field, making quite a few enemies along the way. Ricky Rudd though was just jealous about the fact that the bootleg Wood Brothers team was outrunning him. I then rammed into an Armco barrier though, head on, because I guess I just didn't see it. Either way, because I didn't DNF, that actually got me into the pit window. I then had to drive back through the field again on the restart, and spun out, of course, in the carousel, because I was trying too hard, but I raced back to the caution in 7th. Then on the next restart, I raced my way up to third spot this time, and then, you know, Matt Kenseth kind of got a little bit too slow and brake checked me, which I didn't see coming, so I gained another rival just from that. But more importantly, I tried to make a normal, easy entry into turn one. Grant, I might have changed lanes just a little bit, but that was almost involuntary because it felt like my car was wrecking in every braking zone. But Jeff Gordon absolutely plowed into my rear end into turn one, trying to run straight through me. And I probably would have been okay with this to some degree if it wasn't for the fact that he became a negative 86 rival from this. He hates me. By that logic, I now hate him. And I made the decision internally that revenge is a dish best eaten. When he had the audacity to block me in the S's, I made the decision to send him back a few rows just to let him think about what he's done. And I know that some people out there might think that I actually hate the real Jeff Gordon. Y you're wrong, okay? In fact, I could care less about Jeff Gordon. He evokes no strong emotions one way or the other. He's identical to Kyle Larson in that regard. But the fact of the matter is, every time I do one of these career modes, he is nothing but a nuisance. But we weren't done being stupid on that lap. Ricky Craven blew up in front of the leaders in the carousel, which checked up Harvick and Matt Kenseth. I ran the wall trying to avoid them. I got by Matt Kenseth, and then it was a dogfight between me and Kevin Harvick coming back to the line for the race lead. And I managed to wrestle that spot off of him coming to the caution. So on the restart, I was going for my second win in a row. And I'd already made so many rivals at this point in this race that I just stopped caring. I barreled through Harvick in turn one just to maintain the lead and had to drive it like I stole it just to gap everyone that hated me. And I picked up my second career Winston Cup Series win. The rivals gained was worth the money earned. Now, after a fairy tale 
two week stretch, it was a return to reality at Michigan. I qualified 31st. There was one highlight for me though. On lap three, a massive checkup happened on the back stretch where I did plow into Jeff Green, but I actually managed to move up into 17th, but I really didn't have the pace to stay there. I fell progressively farther back, and because I had to pit twice to make it on fuel and a lot of other drivers didn't, more so than even the first Michigan race, I finished all the way back in 39th. And then we were back at Bristol, which I knew was going to get ugly. Because I've got a lot better equipment than I had back in the spring, I actually qualified in 14th. And while I was still really slow in the race, I wasn't nearly as bad as last time. I really studied up on Ryan Newman's tactics of holding cars off before I started this race, but that became a bit of a problem once Jeff Gordon caught up to me to put me a lap down. You see, Jeff's still upset that he ran me at Watkins Glen, and because of this, I moved up to the outside to let Dale Jr. and Dale Jarrett buy to take first and second. I let Jeff Gordon buy after that, but I wanted to make a bit of a point. But then Jeff Gordon decided to ram me again. The ultimate irony, though, is that him taking that risk of ramming me gave him front end damage that cost him the victory. Dale Jr. drove right away to take the win. Meanwhile, I finished in 40th. And then it was time for Darlington, the Southern 500. And I actually put down a lap good enough for third place in qualifying and was pretty fast. I mean, I hung around there for a little while, but I didn't have that much of a long run car thanks to my tire wear. But on lap 23, Michael Waltrip somehow wrecked McMurray for 36th and brought out the caution. Then in my genius, I was trying to wait to pit until I knew that everybody else would, and I accidentally waited too long and missed pit road. So everyone pitted, except for me. I went down pit road for my stop on lap 31, and I had to come up with a plan to get back on the lead lap. I decided that I'll run as hard as possible to take advantage of these fresh tires, then have a bit of a <clears throat> accident once everyone else has come to pit road. The easiest way that I'd get a caution is if I start blocking Jeff Gordon, but turns out that he still doesn't know how to wreck me. So his teammates served as a pretty good substitution, and I restarted in 39th with a whole lot more people on my lap than I had before. From that point on, I just drove hard through the field and ended up finishing in 15th. Next up was Richmond, where I sat on the pole again, and I spent the entire first stint falling backwards. That is until Ken Schrader spun out by himself, bringing out the caution on lap 24. My pit crew did an outstanding job. I went into the pits in ninth position. I came out in fourth, and thanks to lap traffic, I had the opportunity to lead this race for a little bit. Every member of my pit crew is getting both a raise and a medal after this. But then, you know, I started to fade back a little bit, and thanks to my pit crew invalidating that pay raise and medal ceremony, I cycled out in 27th position, but at least I had the opportunity to mess with Jeff Gordon a little bit. After that, I just rode around for a long time and finished in 27th, although Jeff Gordon actually did manage to win the race. And then we were off to New Hampshire again, where I sat on the pole and spent most of the race going backwards. On lap 7, I made Dale Jarrett upset because I just couldn't hold the bottom line at a decent speed, but at least my free fall during the first stint plateaued at around 19th position. I still fell back farther throughout the whole race, but at least I had an overall quiet race. That's until we got to lap 44, though, when Ricky Rudd ran me coming into turn three and then brake checked me while he was coming to pit road. From there, I tried cruising the thing home, but Dale Jarrett got back to me and we had a bit of an exchange of sentiments. Either way, I body slammed him to a 27th place finish. And after the race, I had some sponsorship negotiations to attend to. I re-signed with NASCAR.com as my primary and associate. I also gained Coca-Cola, 76 Racing Fuels and UAW as partners coming into the mythical Dover night race. I qualified terribly, but the best part of that was the fact that Ricky Rudd started dead last, so we could have ourselves a good old-fashioned rematch. Now there was an attempt at dumping, but I was far too talented for that obviously, and he ended up receiving damage instead. On lap 28 I decided since I'm still terribly slow, I might as well drag Jeff Gordon back a little bit when he tries to lap me. After we made significant contact, I let him go. I then did the exact same thing with Dale Jarrett. And if you can't tell already, it's a mistake to have me as a rival. Life typically becomes a series of regrets when you're on the list. There was a second round of Jeff Gordon blocking. I cost him a couple spots, but he made a major mistake in putting me into the outside wall. Unfortunately for him, that means he's been eliminated from championship contention. 
little later on in the race, I tried to get down to the bottom while Johnny Benson was there and spun out in the turn three. I went and ran the car real hard on the restart to get some track position for once in this race. I got up to 29th spot and uh, stayed there for the rest of the run to the checkered flag. Then we went back to Talladega. I hooked up with Ryan Newman and rocketed through the field easily making my way up into the top 15. After my first pit stop, I met up on track with some good friends, Ricky Rudd and Jeff Gordon, and I tried to hook back up with Ryan Newman, which worked out for just a little bit, but out of necessity, I had to make the tough choice to actually help Jeff Gordon, since Henrik Power really is ridiculously good, and I can mooch off of that a little bit. Although I was able to quickly dump Jeff Gordon for Kevin Harvick. You know, I was on pace to at least have a shot at winning this race, but that was until the caution flag came out for Mike Skinner. Mark Martin got a little too low on the track and clipped Mike Skinner, who was on the apron, and flipped him even more violently than I flipped Matt Kenseth at Chicago. Ward Burton also flipped, Robbie Gordon piled in. It was a true Talladega wreck. I then came to pit road but decided last minute to abort because I wasn't good to make it on fuel from there. I drove up to 11th position before we got a caution for debris and that opened up the opportunity for me to come to pit road and make it all the way to the finish. We then had another debris caution, this time it was for Ricky Rudd. We got yet another caution for debris and I was able to race Ryan Newman back to the line for 6th. We restarted with just 2 laps to go and I didn't have anything to go up there and challenge the leaders so I just blocked to maintain 6th position as best I could. Meanwhile, Bill Elliott actually went and won the race. Next up was Kansas, where I somehow started in 10th and actually got as far up as 7th before I started to fade. Uh, I think fade is the wrong term. Sunk is more appropriate. I was in 29th before I made my first pit stop. Then, you know, I nearly wrecked out getting a little too aggressive with Ken Schrader of all people. And actually, because of how bad I was sucking, I had another opportunity to mess with Jeff Gordon. And from there, I rode around for a little while and finished in 34th. Next up was Charlotte. Let me tell you, the car that we had there was the best oval piece that we brought to a track since Indy. I went out, put the thing on the pole, although I did have a bit of a rough start trying a little too hard to lead the first lap, but I got the lead back coming into turn one on lap two and drove away from the field for a little bit. But trouble arose when I tried to put Ashton Lewis a lap down. I barely tapped him and my car committed jump, forcing me into the outside wall and I barely avoided destroying my fuel cell. I also lost some spots on pit road because I needed that damage repaired, but I chased down Harvick and Mark Martin again to take the lead back. But then I caught up with Ashton Lewis again, and he tried wrecking me, but he just couldn't. A good thing he DNQs enough races, I won't see him very often. But, you know, I made some mistakes on the final run that cost me big time. Main one being almost wrecking myself, trying to pass Kurt Busch because I thought he was coming to pit road so I could take up a little bit more of the bottom line because he'd be going to the apron. I was flat wrong and just about knocked the fence down. Then, you know, Tony Stewart kicked on the afterburner in the final run and just left everyone in the dust. I mean, I didn't have a chance. Neither did Mark Martin, who I was racing with. Lap 78, I almost wrecked again because I overreacted when Mark Martin was on my bumper. I thought I was going to spin myself out by cutting across his nose. So I jerked the car up the hill, but I was clear of him anyways. So all I did was voluntarily put myself in the wall again. In the end, I had to settle for third spot, but that's still a really good finish. It also puts us in a really good position to go for a million bucks in the Winston next season. After Charlotte, Tony Stewart has taken over second in the standings off Jeff Gordon. He's 249 points back from Dale Earnhardt Jr. Next up was Martinsville, but this time I had a plan to not suck so badly. I decided I'm going to try to put as many people into the sand barrels as physically possible to see if it can somehow give me an advantage. I spun out in qualifying and managed to glitch myself into the pit road wall, but I still started in 14th, and it didn't take me very long to spin out in the race either. I almost looped it on lap 3 if it wasn't for Kurt Busch being there to save the car from going all the way around. Then on lap 11. I shoved Mayfield into the sand barrels just for the fun of it. Caused a pretty good stack up, you know, involving the likes of Brett Bodine and Terry Labonte who ended up flipping. Then I shoved Michael Waltrip into the sand barrels and spun myself out. Make note, by the way, of uh, Kurt Busch becoming a minus 100 rival after that. But the most important sand barrel incident that happened in the race was on lap 29. I put Jeff Gordon 
into the sand barrels because there was a 0% chance that I wasn't going to retaliate for Dover. And the sand barrel caution successfully got me off strategy. So when Christian Fittipaldi caused a caution by doing absolutely nothing, I gained a crap ton of track position automatically. I spun out by myself again on lap 64 and ran into Kurt Busch again. Later on, I caught another Christian Fittipaldi caution for nothing. And at this point in the race, I was running in 10th on the lead lap. But then I just about destroyed my car putting Matt Kenseth into the sand barrels, but I was pretty lucky to get away from that. On the restart, I drove up to 15th and put Mark Martin into the barrels for another caution. With five laps to go, Jeff Green rammed me for no reason, and you know what happens to people who do that. Without hesitation, I put him right into the sand barrels, ending the race under caution and solidifying an 11th place finish at Martinsville. Next up was Atlanta, which was another race where I qualified pretty good and spent the entire race falling straight backwards. Although I actually made amends with Robbie Gordon, and thanks to share drafting, we went from rivals to allies in like 10 laps. Fun fact, in this race, I forgot that Kurt Busch was my rival. So when he got to me on lap 19, he pretty much ran straight through me in turn three, and I probably would have been okay if Michael Waltrip wasn't up to my outside. So I spun out, I got the car back going with minimal damage, and I was back in 35th. I was basically running back where my car would have been anyways. Then, you know, I rode around some more back in 33rd position until I noticed just who was behind me. Kurt Busch. And what can I say? I'm an opportunist. I spent the entire last lap just screwing with him to prove a point. Next up was Phoenix, where I had, again, low expectations going off how I fared in New Hampshire, but I realized in the race that I can make up a lot of time in turn three. Although on lap four, I learned exactly what not to do, as I almost flipped the car over when I ran over that curb on the backstretch. By the way, Kurt Busch had a major karma moment when Steve Park blew up right in front of him and landed in his lap. I didn't even have to retaliate. Nature did it for me. Then fittingly, I went and spun out when I tried a little bit too hard to get to the bottom line and I cut across Mark Martin's front end. But then, the greatest pit stop in the history of NASCAR, Christian Fittipaldi was parked sideways on pit road, which kept me from being able to get into my stall. But my crew managed to telepathically pit my car before I even got to them. My car then phased into the correct place in space-time in order to complete the stop. This action allowed my crew to pull off a four-tire pit stop in 11.7 seconds. Now this was the stop that earned them the pay raise and the medals. I raced my way back into the top 10 on the restart and even got the satisfaction of getting Ashton Lewis in trouble. I then got into a bit of a shoving match with Bobby Labonte that I ended up winning as well, and I brought it home in 12th. Then it was time for the penultimate race of the season at Rockingham, where Dale Earnhardt Jr. can clinch the championship since he has a ridiculous 321 point advantage above Jeff Gordon, which, by the way, Dale can thank me for later. I rode around in 28th position for a lot of the early portion of the race and slowly drifted back to 37th before I almost wrecked with Stanton Barrett and Kevin LePage. But then I got around those two and held up Jeff Gordon at the same time in a very nice combo. I got back up to 33rd position and finished there, but meanwhile, the biggest headline of the weekend is the fact that Dale Earnhardt Jr. is the 2003 NASCAR Winston Cup Series champion. We've still got some racing left this season, though. Coming into the Ford 400 at Homestead Miami Speedway, me and Elliot Sadler actually tied for 23rd in points. Oh, and uh, Jamie McMurray, he's already officially clinched the Rookie of the Year award, which I could kind of care less about. Just my Brickyard 400 win alone pays more than that award anyway. At Homestead, I raced up to 22nd early on the race, but dropped back to 29th. And in the final pit stop of the season, my crew absolutely delivered. Four tires and fuel in just 16 seconds. That allowed me to get all the way back up to 23rd position, which I held to the checkered flag. Dale Jarrett won the final race of the season by 69 one thousandths of a second above Kevin Harvick. Also, Elliot Sadler finished ahead of me in the race, so I ended up finishing 24th in the point standings, which is 
really solid for my first season. I think what stands out to me the most though is the fact that I did complete the no DNF challenge and I saved a lot of money in doing so. By the way, Dale Jr. won the title by 346 points. In 36 starts, he got 34 top 10s. My god. I also ended the season without a single rival, so it's like a reset going into season two. I get to end my season with seven poles, two wins, and a 24th place finish in the point standings, way above my initial expectations. In the offseason, we had three drivers retire. Mike Skinner stepped away after his horrible Talladega wreck and was replaced by Chase Montgomery. And along with him, we had Ken Schrader and Kevin LePage retire while both of their teams closed. In the end, I made quite a bit of money this season, won some polls, won some races, made some enemies, but I'm one step closer to a championship, and I've got some good momentum rolling into season two. You know, this has been pretty fun. Infuriating at times, but still really fun. I really hope you enjoyed this one, and remember, this is only the first season. I'll probably need to run three to four seasons to go up there and contend for a championship. Also, I want to take a moment to thank all of my channel supporters, past and present, for all of your support. It is incredibly appreciated. I'll be alternating back and forth between these Thunder 04 career mode videos and other things. Like, my next video will be the Dirt to Daytona retrospective video, and then right after that video will be Season 2 of this NASCAR Thunder 2004 career mode. Anyways, I hope you enjoyed my Season 1 experience with Flip Witham. It was a learning experience, and we got into some major rivalries, but overall, those two victories made it very worth it. And for Season 2, I'm going to be chasing after a top 10 points finish. So, as always, I'll see you next time.